Welcome everybody to Race in the City, part three, critical conversation, work, community, and protest, 1820 to 1970, based on the book uh, edited by Henry Lewis Taylor. And I want to acknowledge that a number of you have attended all three events or uh, the other events as well. So we thank you for your contributions and your um, continuing to join us. And to that point, Melanie um, heard some feedback from a couple of you, and there may be some time where Melanie will ask you to share some thoughts on your involvement in the series. But of course, this is an interactive discussion, a critical conversation where all voices matter in a safe environment. Um, you can type questions in the chat, uh, but the way the evening will work after we do introductions, uh, we have a chapter champion who will summarize this chapter. And tonight, as you know, we're focusing on the history of protest in the city. And all that leads to a, a very, very important milestone in our community. Um, so a moment of reflection here, but our Black Events and Exhibits Committee is working on a very important memorial and tribute to the legacy of Timothy Thomas. The 20th anniversary of Timothy's death in April 20. 21. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy to share out that the library is collaborating with the uh, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center and the Cincinnati Museum Center at Union Terminal for a panel conversation, community conversation led by community leaders who will be reflecting on and discussing the vital, vital topics related to and to honor Timothy Thomas and his death, and also discuss the police collaborative refresh and all of the community work that's been put into, including the work of the Black United Front, who representatives of that will be there for police and community reform based on the legacy of Timothy Thomas. I'm sorry we don't have the exact date yet, but please watch the library calendar as we know you all do because you registered and joined us tonight. Um, we're very proud on that, and we could be uh, in collaboration with some other community groups to further honor uh, Mr. Thomas's legacy. So please be on the lookout for that. But without further ado, and I just want to give an extra special thank you to Melanie Moon tonight for our third installment. Um, uh, Melanie has devoted so much time and commitment to sharing what she's doing with this work in the community. The race and the city conversations have occurred at multiple locations and venues, of course, Zoom because of the pandemic, but touching many lives, many folks from all over our region. So hats off to Melanie and just a special thank you tonight for your contributions and your commitment to community, this anti-racism work where we discuss openly and freely our perspectives and we learn. We've, we've learned a lot. I've learned a lot, a lot of introspection. So just a special thank you. Um, and I want to share out your biography now. Melanie was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. She attended Evanston Elementary School until seventh grade when her parents moved to Glendale. She graduated from Princeton High School in 1971 and Miami University in 1975. She earned a master's degree in library science at the University of Kentucky and another in childhood development at the University of Cincinnati while raising her now four grown children. Melanie served as library director for Princeton City Schools, Cincinnati Hills Christian Academy, Brown Mackey College, and Greater Emmanuel Apostolic Temple, where she has also served as a deaconess for several years. Melanie feels led of God to do this work of racial justice not just because of the state of our world today, but to clear a path for Sesman, Naomi, Brooke, and Daphne, her grandchildren. So welcome, Melanie. And if you would touch on, as we've done each time, your concept and the incredible idea of a chapter champions to help us digest and understand more fully this great book. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, for this venue, for this opportunity to share uh, this book with, uh, with the Cincinnati community. And I felt that the best way to get this book out was by uh, 
having people just devote themselves to reading uh, and learning one chapter. So I call them chapter champions. And uh, when we have an opportunity to present uh, at a venue for a church, a civic or a social organization, uh, we usually go one chapter a week or every two weeks, however the venue chooses to do that. And when it is the chapter champions week, they come in and they present their chapter and um, we try to record it and archive those recordings so that uh, if somebody wants to look at it in the future, they can. But this way, no one is burdened to read the entire book. And I consider it a burden because it is a scholarly work. It, there's, it's a compilation of scholarly essays with footnotes and references and maps and charts. And everybody just doesn't get into that. So uh, just one chapter, one chapter, and present that chapter when called upon. So that's it. Thank you. And now that we know, and many of you did know, but thank you for sharing the idea of chapter champion, I'd like to introduce and welcome Mary Randolph, uh, a member of our Black Events and Exhibits team. And Mary is the branch manager of the Coryville Branch Library. And she will be focusing on and sharing out her thoughts and notes and kind of questions uh, of the protest chapter that we're discussing tonight. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks, Melanie. And um, I'm really thrilled to be part of this whole project and didn't know what to expect. Um, <clears throat> it sounded daunting to be in charge of a chapter, um, but I really, really got into it. Um, it led me to further, you know, educate myself and look into um, things I just didn't remember or know about. Um, so thank all of you for being here. I'm starting to recognize your faces now. Um, and thanks for participating and being part of this. Um, I'm sorry to see it end. I'm sorry that this is the last, um, but I'm sure it will continue in other fashions. Um, but I appreciate being part of this process. Um, chapter 11 um, is the chapter that we're discussing tonight, authored by Nina Jagkidge, and it's entitled Behind the Scenes, the Cincinnati Urban League from 1948 to 1963. Um, I do have some notes I'll share with you, just sort of uh, outline of the chapter. Um, and like Melanie said, the chapters tend to be scholarly, um, a lot of, names a lot of organizations and dates. Um, and this chapter definitely had its fill of um, historical um, dates and things like that that can be a little dry, um, but I will share my screen um, and just sort of give you my outline that you can follow along with. <clears throat> so hopefully you guys can see that. Um, the chapter begins with a discussion of um, Cincinnati and its sort of geographical placement within the nation as a border, you know, being on the border of the North and the South. So we've always lived with this duality, um, sometimes considered the end of the North and the beginning of the South. And the author um, spends a little time talking about, begins the chapter with a discussion of the differences during this time period of, of um, civil rights in the North, which is Cincinnati, um, versus the South. So in the South during that time, um, we have groups um, such as the NAACP, uh, the a lot of groups, um, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and all their initials that come after that. <laughs> so some of those groups I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and Martin Luther King, of course, is, is someone we all can identify with or can not identify with, but remember. And um, those are the groups that were involved in the South. In, the, in Cincinnati, um, to a lesser degree, the NAACP they had a presence, but on a smaller scale. Um, 
a few other groups, but most notably the um, Cincinnati Urban League. And the chapter spends a lot of time talking about the Cincinnati Urban League in Cincinnati during this time. Um, the major differences um, between what was going on in the South versus the North. Um, in the South, the, the things that were going on were very aggressive or more aggressive. Um, they were charismatic, if you think of Martin Luther King. Um, they were publicized, there were sit-ins, um, protests, marches, boycotts. Um, this was all going on in the South, but not so much in the North. So the North was, and when I say North, I'm, I'm referring to Cincinnati. Um, in Cincinnati, things were, were, being, were being addressed in a much quieter fashion. A, and as the, as the title of the chapter says, behind the scenes is very indicative of, of how things were progressing. Um, there were not many protests. There weren't any, you know, m many protests during that time or sit-ins or marches um, of any big degree in Cincinnati. So that's the difference between kind of what was going on in the North Cincinnati and the South. Um, the the areas of focus um, in Cincinnati for, in particular, the um, Urban League was, um, there were three areas that they kind of concentrated on. And one, one was jobs, the second was education, and the third were the recreational facilities in Cincinnati. Um, examples are given. So when the, when the chapter discusses job opportunities um, with the number of black, um, people increasing in Cincinnati, the Urban League um, wanted to address um, how, many how many black people were employed in certain industries. Um, Shilatos is an example that comes up um, as a department store that you probably remember um, or may have heard of. Um, the president of the Urban League approached, um, his name was Fred Lazarus, and I guess that's Shilato's became Lazarus, or I'm familiar with that as another department store, but um, the Urban League approached Fred Lazarus to, you know, inquire or to push um, him to employ at least one Black salesperson, because there were none at that time, um, and the way the Urban League operated was more to form relationships with friendships, kind of a slow, um, you know, push for change, nothing too aggressive, nothing too public or publicized. So um, this is an example in this industry of how um, the Urban League put kind of made their way or made relationships with the uh, Fred Lazarus to ask him to employ a black salesperson. He's quoted as saying, um, well, I don't know if he's quoted as saying, but the gist of it is that he agreed that there should be, but that maybe now was not the right time. And that theme keeps reoccurring with all these industries that say, that seems like a good idea. I think we'll do that sometime, but not, not this year, or it's not, we're not quite ready for that yet. So um, Fred Lazarus was um, asked to join the board of the Urban League and eventually he, um, he did hire his first black sales associate or salesperson. So that was kind of the tactic was to get him on board, to befriend him, to kind of appeal to his moral conscious um, and to slowly make some changes. Um, the second realm or second uh, category was education. Um, and of course we learned about that from our other chapters a little bit. Um, the notable example here was of a um, Springmeyer school had a um, black family in their district with three children and 
the children were denied admittance to the school. And the principal um, asked that they, the children attend the um, Addiston School, which was a neighboring, I guess, district. Um, and the Addison School said, yes, you can come here, but we cannot bus your, we can't, your children have no way to get here. We won't, we won't bus them because they're not in the district. So um, the Urban League worked to put mild pressure on the principals to find a solution. Um, again, not a very publicized, you know, or um, dramatic push, but eventually the Addison School was, um, persuaded to um, have the children attend their school and they did arrange to bus them, but it took three years. So three years, these children had no school to go to. Um, another example of slow progress, um, but nonetheless, they, I guess they got the job done eventually. And the third category, recreational facilities. Um, and the big example that takes up a lot of the chapter um, is Coney Island. So a brief summary is that um, it took years of work to eventually desegregate Coney. In 1955, Coney, Coney did open to all races, but the pool and moonlight gardens was excluded from um, in other words, outwardly, they said, yes, anybody can come to our facility, but um, Black people cannot use the pool and they cannot go to the Moonlight Gardens, which were the main attractions at Coney at that time. Um, so it wasn't until 1961 that Coney Island was fully desegregated. Um, I don't know if my outline, if you can see the whole thing. Um, I'm kind of beyond what you can see maybe, but maybe that's okay. Um, so it, Coney, the, the chapter spends a good deal of time going through all the years of Coney's, you know, all the back and forth kind of um, negotiations with, um, Schott was the president. His last name was Schott of Coney at the time. Um, he, again, like the Fred Lazarus, was agreeable to the idea of admitting um, Black people to the facility, but would always say, like, we just, we aren't ready for that right now. And, and we'll do it next year. And that seems like, you know, next year will be a good time for that. But as the years progressed, it, it just um, never happened. Um, in 1952, the chapter talks about members of the NAACP. Um, and I believe Marion Spencer was a part of the group that attempted to enter Coney and they were denied. Um, and filed, they filed a lawsuit at that point. Um, it's interesting that Marion Spencer is not named specifically in this chapter. So I had to do a little, a tiny bit of dig. I, I know of Marion Spencer. I know um, about some of the positions she held and the um, her role in the desegregation of Coney Island, but I didn't really know or remember as much as I thought I did. So I did a little digging um, and kind of read up on her and um, didn't really know that she interestingly did not set out to be, um, she didn't want, she wasn't planning to speak um, or to be, um, a major force in the, you know, race relations. And she was a mother, had two sons who heard about Coney Island on the radio. And they asked their mom, you know, like most children hear about something fun. Can we go? Let's, let's go to Coney Island. And, and that's what sparked her to that desire for change um, in her and how she got involved. Um, so that was interesting to read about. Um, 
So that was in 1952. In 1955 is, you know, and, and other groups attempted to go to Coney in, in pairs or single, in, no big groups went, no big dramatics. It was all very like quiet and a few individuals would try to um, gain entrance and be turned away. Um, in 1955 is when the president of Coney said that it would be open to everyone, excluding Moonlight Gardens and the pool. Um, a couple years after that, in like 1960, a group of 12 individuals um, attempted to enter and six of those people were arrested. And so that, that began a little more publicity and the shot began to like fear that that might economically impact Coney. Um, and so that along with the court case, um, that is when finally Coney was open to everyone. Um, but it did take a good number of years. And again, the theme was, you know, slow going. Um, Coney wanted it to be a very step-by-step -step process, a very n not unpublicized, nothing in the papers, um, very friendly, gradual approach to um, opening to Blacks. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, is that an effect, was the Urban League very effective? Could they have been more effective? Um, and, and I guess the answer is yes and no. They did make some progress, but, you know, definitely not in a speedy manner. Um, in 1964, the um, Civil Rights Act um, is passed, the establishment of the Equal, Op um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So things begin to speed up a bit. And at that point, it becomes obvious that, you know, things are gonna move faster. Um, the Urban League's tactics are kind of, are becoming outdated. There's just no going back to that slow progress. Um, things are heating up. Um, and so, you know, compared to, to 1964 and beyond, yes, it seems like that the Urban League wasn't as effective as they could have been. Um, they do mention in the chapter other demonstrations that happened in Cincinnati. Um, for example, there was picketing at one point at Woolworths department store. Um, and the people picketing were, were more wanting to bring attention to how Woolworths as an organization were treating employees in the South rather than maybe Cincinnati. Likewise, um, there were gatherings at the Hamilton County Courthouse of prayer and singing and protesting how Blacks were being treated in the South. So just a way to um, bring attention to that, but none of these were huge gatherings. Um, none were, you know, publicized very, very much. Um, there were gatherings at um, construction sites to protest uh, construction trade practices. Um, again, very non-confrontational. In 1963, um, the Cincinnati Enquirer quote, and this is a quote that I'm reading, um, says, what's wrong? Why are the Negroes protesting? Isn't all the discrimination and segregation the South's worry? What are all these meetings and pronouncements about? Why the demonstrations, the picketing, the boycotting here in fair-minded Cincinnati? So that to me kind of, summarizes like you know the fact that Cincinnati felt like they were part of the north and not no you know there's no real issues here and we're not like the south and people's black people's lives are fine like what's what is like what's the problem <laughs> basically is what I took from that um I'd stop sharing my screen here um 
I guess I might pause there to see if anybody has, um, that's kind of toward the end of the chapter and end of the summary um, that I have. Um, I do have other details that we can talk about, but um, anybody have any comments, questions about Marion Spencer? Hi, Mary. Uh, it's Catherine. Hey. Um, I, I just uh, really appreciate the um, the book in the fact that it's it's specific to Cincinnati and it's given me a lot of you know like food for thought. Um, even if you know I wasn't alive during most of the content in this chapter. Um, I do feel like we weren't really taught about these events in school, at least at my school. And even though it's local history, like it just never, I never knew about Coney Island. I didn't know um, a lot about these things. So uh, I appreciate the local focus of the book. And that's one of the things that stands out to me is that I could grow up here and not know any of this. You know, it's just kind of given me a jolt a little bit, I guess. I have a comment. I moved here in 2015. So I wasn't raised here, but one of the first things I did when I came was went to the, you know, Freedom Center and understood about the Underground Railroad connection in this area and toured the home in Glendale that had, was supposed to have been part of the Underground Railroad system and things. And I thought, oh, wow, like by way of Chicago, but originally from Memphis, I was 10 years old when Martin Luther King Jr. was shot in Memphis, living in Memphis. Um, I thought, oh, like what a, like progressive city I live in now, you know. And then last year happened and more things came out. So this this study interested me to under to understand more about Cincinnati and its history. Uh, so it's been like very enlightening for me. And if you don't mind if I take just a short minute that I was in a conversation yesterday that um, we're in a group that that talks about race and one of the gals is from Norwood about my age 60-ish and uh, said I knew when I was growing up in Norwood it was all white I was aware that it was all white and I knew there were blacks that lived in areas around us but I never actually realized that I lived in a redlined community where it was forced to be white. And she had a conversation with someone that's much more conservative than her and talked about her family having that opportunity to buy homes over time in that area and accumulate that, that type of wealth that allowed her to go to college that then the blacks didn't have. And that person who's usually vehement against her in their political views said, what do you think about retribution? Re Not retribution, I know what the word is. Um, reparations. reparations. And, and she said, well, it can be in many different forms. And she said, it doesn't have to be like just cash, but schools or jobs or whatever. And this person on the other side of the political spectrum from her said, I never thought of all that, that makes sense. So I think it's the more we learn, the more we know where we came from, the more we learn. For me, the better ally I become. And this type of learning is just so instrumental. And I, and I think 
Melanie and I thank David and I thank the library system and everybody that's been involved in this so much. You're so welcome, Diane. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Jennifer. Can I say something? Um, I I just want to acknowledge that I feel really angry. Um, so I just I'm going to say that I I hope that lots of you feel angry with me. Um, and the comment I want to make about the chapter is, I I was thinking um, with such respect about. Uh, different factions of making things happen. So to me, I was hearing um, in the actions of the Urban League, this quiet attention, this like polite moving things forward, making friends, making friends in high places, trying to kindly, you know, negotiate um, a movement and, and action. And then I was thinking about how, you know, like, all of the people who take action with um, with anger and uh, more loudly and um, maybe taking to the streets and um, you know we demonstrate in different ways and I just um, I, I've just I feel like this chapter makes me sit with how uh, progress how moving things forward sometimes takes, um different forms and maybe it's not just about is one does one form work is it just one thing but maybe um it seems to me that often uh to really make change happen there is there there has been at least in this moment in this context we're talking about combination of tactics that's all i want to say right now i i have a couple things to say um I grew up in Cincinnati and I'm older than Melanie, I'm white. So of course I went to, to Coney Island as a child. And I was, uh, let's see, in 53, I was about five or six years old. Um, but I can remember talk about Coney was going to be integrated. And there was a, a bit of a stir. I don't think my, my family was terribly upset about that, but they, it, was, it was mentioned that that was going to happen and, you know, what would that be like? And, um, but it seemed like it went on. You know, we'd go back the next year and it would not be integrated and the year after that. <laughs> so I guess I didn't know all that was going on, of course, in the background. Um, and then it eventually, I, I was in like seventh or eighth grade when it finally was, and, and we weren't going that much anymore. And I'm not sure why. I mean, it could have been because it was integrated. I don't know, um, or we just got you know older. Um, but anyway, that the other the same thing. I can remember the same thing about Cowan Lake, because my family used to go to Cowan Lake every summer, every every Saturday all summer, and sometimes on Sunday. And there was a a big to do about when Cowan Lake you know was going to quote let the blacks in. And as a child, I can remember thinking, well, why, what difference does it make? But of course, I, you know, I, it obviously made a difference to a lot of people um, older than me. And, um, but I, I can remember it going on as a child. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share um, was I have this book. I think it'll come out right to you. Keep on fighting. Um, it's a, the Life and Civil Rights Legacy of Marion A. Spencer um, by Dot Christensen. And it's, I'm sure it's in the library. Um, and um, I just wanted to, if people want to know more about Marion, it's a fascinating read. Um, I, I know Dot uh, also worked, I didn't work ever work with her, but I knew of her when I was working as a social worker and she was at, I don't know, Better Housing League, I think. <clears throat> then I'm not sure, but um, and and she's a member of the church that I go to, so you know we we kind of held her hand as she went through the writing process. But it was uh, she befriended Marion, and they talked about you know. Dot said, "I think you should." 
It was actually written, I think, for Marion's children was the, uh, the reason that they got it all started, but it turned into a bigger project. Um, anyway, that's all I wanted to add at this point, except thank you to David for letting me in on this when I was attending Mar uh, Melanie's group at uh, 55 North and I couldn't go there today. So <laughs> here I am. <laughs> My understanding, and thanks for sharing that, Cynthia, is Marion Spencer was so modest, she didn't want a book written about herself. But when Dot Christensen framed it as sort of a what, what a scrapbook of memories for her boys, oh. for her son, she agreed to do that. And for her son, you know, so her sons would know more about her life and as a gift to her sons. And I was always touched by that. Yeah. I mean, she talks about, I think, standing in her... Um, her grandparents, I think they lived with her grandparents. Um, but um, yeah, watching the Ku Klux Klan come down the street. So that was she, I, she wasn't in Cincinnati then, I don't think, but um, was in the South. But she had, she had the whole gamut of life. Um, many of you might be aware that there is a statue of Marion, almost finished, um, created and sponsored by the Women's City Club to be um, placed in Smale Park. And the memorial inaugural event was supposed to happen, I believe, last summer, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. So please be on the lookout for that. It'll be in the local media, I'm sure, when the statue will be placed and celebrated, but it's also known that it's the first statue of a woman in Cincinnati. And that's another story. Just real fast, my mom, was my mom was explaining to me that there's two women's city clubs and like the apostrophes in a different place. So, cause we were talking about it a few chapters ago, we were talking about the, um, the women's city club actually being a, a port, like a part uh, in the twenties, I believe, of actually creating the policies that were the beginning of redlining. Oh, and I mean, the overt um, beginning of uh, like policy uh, redlining. And so, just to say, I'm um, in case anybody else was curious that there are two, <laughs> so there might be different histories might be something to learn more about. And I can speak for the Woman City Club and I will because Marion Spencer was president and extremely important to her. And it's woman, W-O-M-A-N apostrophe S. Uh, but Woman City Club began in 1911, uh, basically essentially uh, committed to social justice all along. And they did major work on suffrage early on in Cincinnati. So I can pop a link. The other reason I wanted to bring it up is they have several other uh, events coming up that are very timely, um, including com co police community reform, as we've been talking about this evening. So I think it's fair to pop that link in. Um, so we'll be aware of those events if you're interested in honor of Marion as well, who was a longtime member of Woman City Club. Well, I just want to chime in before we sign off that uh, been an amazing um, three sessions. It has definitely been eye opener for me. It's been it's been a learning experience because a lot of it I didn't know either. I was born in '66, born here, but raised in California. Um, and just too young, too ignorant to, to dig into it, to, to learn about it when I got here, you know, all the, the redlining that we spoke about. Um, and, and, you know, I heard about Coney Island. Um, and, sad, and sadly, I still haven't been to Coney Island. 
you know, but just learning about, you know, like Sheila toes as, as Mary was talking about and, and that um, NAACP went to try to change to their mindset about hiring black people, you know, um, it could have been perhaps that there was not enough resources or just, um, they were just grounded in their way of thinking of, of, of that prejudiced way of thinking that to exclude this race, um, even though things have changed, as I said before, and, the, and probably even the first, we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. A lot of fight uh, that we need to put up to change uh, the trajectory of some things. Um, and even at times, it feels as if it may take a step forward and we're take there we're two or three steps back um but we we will continue to fight hopefully as mary said that there'll be more um sessions like these or things like these in the future that we can expound upon you know that we just keep shining light i am grateful to miss melanie moon uh, and the rest of the team and i'm proud and happy to say that i was a part of this team Thank you all so very much for um, joining in and just, yeah, again, shining that light. I, I feel so much more, I don't know how to describe it, but just there's a light now and I'm grateful. So thank you all. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> Good evening. I wanted to make a comment. My name is Linda Lee Thomas, and I apologize. I came on late because I couldn't find the link, and I was exasperated, but glad to have had the opportunity to join in. Um, and I kind of feel like I walked in in the middle of the movie, so I was trying to catch up. But the uh, the conversation about Mary and Spencer was very uh, illuminating. And, uh, and very important to me. I had to, I moved, I'm from South Georgia originally. So I grew up in the um, 50s, 60s. Um, Martin, I'm from Albany, Georgia. So one of the major civil rights marches was in Albany, Georgia. And I was a little kid. So all that stuff is very present for me. And it's especially present for me this week with all that's going on. And uh, so I welcome the opportunity to hear the perspective of, of, of people who have a different experience than I do, because that's very growthful for me. Uh, I met Marion Spencer when I moved to Cincinnati to work right out of college. And soon afterwards, she was the president of the local NAACP. And I think she was the first woman to hold that role. And um, just an incredibly impressive individual that I had a chance to spend quite a lot of time with. I'm also uh, on the board of park commissioners and we are partnering with the women's club, the, the uh, women's city club to, um, to make that statue in Smell Park available. So look out on the park's website and then social media for uh, announcements about it. I know we've got a promotion about it coming that should be out right now. It's, a, it's an incredible honor to, um, to just be a part of that and to see the city and the club recognizing such a phenomenal woman and um, just a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to be here this evening. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for sharing that. Yes, um, thank you. And I believe, um, Let's see, Candace. Yes, please welcome, uh, welcome, and please um, share your thoughts. Hello, hi. I'm kind of nervous. This is my first time being on a platform like oh. this. Um, I just happened to be at the taking my grandmother 
to fax some paperwork at the library and I happen to see this flyer. And I get emotional because my heart started beating fast. I got goosebumps and I felt a voice say, this is it. So for years, me and my brother have talked about the very things without ever reading this book that we have went through in this city, far as the employment, the housing, and even the protest. And my brother actually has a podcast called Jackson's Motivation. And we did a podcast on systemic racism in Cincinnati and what we, um, our views on it. And I just want to say that it's a huge problem and that I'm glad that I have the opportunity to speak here because I feel like I was, it's, it's something I was born to do and I will do whatever it takes for us to be seen as equals and as human beings and be able to work and to live and be able to breathe and laugh and smile just as well as anyone else without any equivocations or any any anything that we have to do extra to prove ourselves. Um, as far as my experience um, growing up in Cincinnati, I actually grew up in Norwood. Um, I was born in 1986, so I was in 91 is when I first experienced, um, I didn't understand what was going on as far as you would almost think the way my teachers acted that we had COVID back then far as, okay, don't touch this and wiping off things if I did touch it, or as far as um, I couldn't sit with everyone else or play with everyone else. Um, as far as them asking, is my mom my aunt? Because my mom is um, Native American. So they asked her, is that your mom? And it's, it was kind of weird, but I didn't grasp until I got to high school what was going on. My mom never taught us like you're black, like you're this, you're that. She taught us you have a heart, you're a human being, and that's how you treat people. So once I got to high school, it was really rough in Norwood still in 2000, 2004. I don't care if we can live in the place and work in the place and it on the outside, it looks like everything's great, but it's not. Just because people allow us to do certain things doesn't mean, and when I say that word allow, it hurts me to even say that they allow us to do it when it should be just an automatic right to us as a human being um, that we should be able to do. And growing up in Norwood, a lot of people say that I was sheltered, but what I was sheltered from was the the full black experience of living in a black neighborhood in a predominantly black neighborhood. So when I did have to switch over from Norwood and go to Roselawn, it was like a culture shock. And at the same time, I wasn't accepted either. I had curly hair, I was light skin, what they call us mixed, which there's no mix, there's no difference. We're all, we're black. You have one drop, you're black. And dealing with that in the same city as Cincinnati and then working since I was 15 years old, um, and going out and getting a job at during that time as well and going to two different schools, it was like, you can't work here. And you're like, why, why, why won't I get an opportunity as um, someone else? What I'm getting at is I've worked in the same field for 19 years. And when I go to get a job somewhere, it's, you can work on the fry, you can be a fry cook or you can you know, be a cashier. I've worked in food service and in customer service 19 years. And I still struggle with um, the last place I worked. Um, it was like, I was too dark to work up front um, as I was told. And I'm like, this is 2020. Like, what, what do you mean I'm too dark? I, I didn't understand that. But then I had to look at their leaders and who's leading them. This was a black man telling me this, but who, who is he looking up to? You know, no matter the race, but what if, who was he looking up to and what systems is he accustomed to um, thinking this is the way it goes in Cincinnati? And in a way, I didn't blame him because it's everywhere. I did my research and in between Rookwood, Oakley, uh, uh, what is it, Kimwood and um, Hyde Park, there's 302 stores on an average, 178 places to get food. But 
There's no grocery store in Avondale and they're taking the only family dollar out of Madisonville. You know, I may be, I know I'm probably all over the place and I'm nervous, but it's been, it's, it, there's so much in there. There's so much that I've tried to pack down because I'm, I'm not the best in English and I'm not the best at articulating because I'm emotional, how to get out what I need to get out. So when my mom died, it was like, I have my, both my parents are gone, but she died almost seven years ago. I have to do something for them. They, they are, I feel like they live through me and I have to do something for um, the women um, the, before me and after me. It's my duty as a black woman and, and as a human being to do that for every race, not just one race, but, but I, I feel like it's my duty as a black woman to do that. And um, in every facet, and I feel like in this city, it is um, it's hard because they want to keep you in this little box. And you go out the little box, they say, nope, here's your liquor store, here's your corner store. You survive off that. That's what you need. What they don't realize between Avondale, Bond Hill, and Roseland, I went to 17 corner stores. And out of all 17, most of them, but maybe two had expired product, not by six months, not by a year, two years, canned goods, medicine, soda. And, it's, and that's just a part of, it has to be, it, it's systematic. That's the way they want it, you know? And it's, and it's now I'm, I'm about to move and it's like, where do I move to? It's $900 for something that used to cost um, four or $500 a little bit ago. And they go into the housing medium that's set by HUD and all these other programs that we may look forward to. It's like, throw this glitter at them so they can think these people are helping, but they're not. They're just helping to keep the system exactly the way it is. And I feel like COVID gave them like the leeway to do it. Yes, there's vi uh, evictions and different things going on, but you can move once these people get out and these people sell these buildings that they don't want to deal with anymore, they can take that rent and say, here's $1,200. Because 50,000 want, 50, people want to move to Cincinnati, but there's only 5,000 homes. But what about the people who live here? We pay taxes. We, we have, we, our children are here. Our families are here. And it's like, nope, here's $500 million into downtown. Let's put some bars or, and there's 40 breweries in Cincinnati. But if there was one brewery in every black neighborhood, we could at least put a grocery store in every black, I'm not, I'm sorry. We could at least put a grocery store in every black neighborhood if we can have 40 breweries, but they're not looking at in a square feet, how many people have access to what? Mm. I'm sorry, I could go on and on. I know we only got a certain amount of time. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Candace. thank you for pouring out your heart and I can feel it. I can feel it. I can, I can sympathize. I can empathize. And it is a truth that is not often shared. And I'm, I'm grateful as are all of you for this venue, this opportunity to hear your heart, a young woman going through systemic, systematic racism, Right now in 2021, it is alive, it's kicking, and, uh, and hopefully we're shedding light on it. And thank you so much, Candace. Thank you for sharing. I know that that was hard for you um, to open up like that, but it's beneficial. We need to hear it. We need to hear it. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was extremely hard because um, not having my mom and I haven't had my dad since I was one, but not having my mom is, is weird, you know, and because I'm divided, I don't know my white side. I would love to know them. Like, I don't know them, but I don't know most of my black side because they just now started dealing with me. Mm. So, and we're in the same, they live, some of them live in the same city. One lives in, um, Silverton, one lives in um, like Lachlan area or so forth, uh, St. Bernard, I'm sorry. But it's like, we live in, we, uh, why though? Like, and, and, it's, and it's hard not having the support even just for a little thing, you know, since my mom's been gone. But when I've seen this platform and I look at this stuff every day, I have a heart to where 
I can't walk up past a homeless person and not give him something. I can't, or I'll think about it. Or if I'm driving down the highway and I see a big piece of metal, I stop my car and I go take it out. Um, I, I have to help in some way because it helps me deal with my grief and my, and my turmoil and not to internalize it and still try to process it every day and breathe. And you try to go maybe to your community and so forth. And it's hard because they're like, no, you live here, you live, you work here, you do, you can work here, but you, we don't want you to live here. And it's, I think it's in a gist of what I'm trying to say is just, it's hard not having um, the support and being valued as a human being and for people in 2020. So whoever can hold a phone, you mm -hmm. understand racism. If you have a telephone, you can get on the internet, you can operate that, you, you understand racism. No sweet, it's no, it, no, it's no, it's more excuses, no sweeping it under the rug, no acting like some people are just uh, being brought to it. I completely understand that. But now that we're in 2021, it, 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 I'm not saying everyone should understand it, no, but at the same time, um, take your own responsibility and your part in it and do something about it rather than just sitting here. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, I feel like, like this is what I feel like right now. I don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm going to move. I don't want to move on the West side. I grew up in Nor. I still live in Norwood, but it's 1395 where I live at for half of a house. But at the time, where, where was I going to live at? You know, and if I move because I've been on unemployment, they're not going to take me. I don't care if I do have $20,000 in the bank. They're not going to take me. They're not going to tell me to, um, they're not going to oh help get this program or that program or they started the 513 get vaccinated if you had money to put up make a website for us to get vaccinated and then get housing you could have put a grocery store somewhere Just don't 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 that's like that's that's like salt on the wound don't do that to us that's an insult we we are better than that you want us to work here but not live here mhm mm mhm mm Candace, I've put my contact information in the chat. Please take it down. Please call me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Candace. All your words are resonating and your voice is so important. You covered a number of topics that as you've been saying are, are just symptoms that are just wounds on the surface of so many systemic problems. Housing, health, public health, employment. And I'll never forget this, this event this evening in part thanks to your words. Are there other thoughts connecting to what uh, Candace is saying, or thoughts of what we've been discussing so far, folks that maybe haven't had an opportunity or haven't felt like speaking that now do feel like speaking and sharing. I'm, I'm not good at business, so I'm just going to get on and say out loud, Candace, that I'm really glad you found this group tonight. This is my first night with this group as well, but I've been involved with the book. Um, I, I just wish you the best. I know it's hard. I can't even begin to imagine how hard it is to be in your shoes at any point in time, um, but I'm, I'm glad you found your way here tonight, and I, I hope that you can find some strength in in the group somehow. I just want to say, Mary, you, you did an amazing job um, on this third uh, session and opening it up and uh, it just exploded. So you, you went out with the bang, Mary. <laughs> great, thank you. great session. Um, thank you, Candace. Yeah, this, this one went out full throttle. Great session.
Yes, you, very good session. Yes, yes, we can hear you, Kim. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, I wanted to say one thing about just the chapters as a whole. First of all, Melanie, thank you for reading those to us. It was I, I used to work with Melanie years ago, and it was a joy to hear your voice again, listening to those chapters, and um, very educational for me. I taught elementary school when I first came to Cincinnati in 1993 and um, taught until my kids were born. And I am struck by the fact that I'm just now learning some of these things about um, our history in Cincinnati when I taught it to my kids in elementary school. And specifically teaching in a district that was that was very close to um, um, the area in Glendale that you were talking about that had, you know, that we could have walked to really to teach the kids about um, the history. We taught black history, but we didn't teach it uh, within Cincinnati. And, you know, that's something that I'd really love to see change um, so that kids are learning how this you know, how they came to be where they are even. So that's huge. Um, you know, and I have been trying to learn in, especially in this last year about my own white privilege. And um, I guess my question coming out of all of this is what, what can we do? What, you know, from here, it's the question of, you know, we're learning, but what do we do about this? Well, thank you, Kim, for asking that question. Um, and uh, unfortunately, our time is, is running out here, but I, I am planning to do a summarization and solutions that I believe that God has given me and uh, with regard to employment and housing, because housing is where the wealth is. In this country, you can build wealth through ownership, for, property ownership. And then my idea with regard to employment, I call it affirmative action on steroids. And I would love to share that with any of you that are interested. I will be having, um, I won't be able to share that tomorrow, but next Thursday, the 8th of April at that uh, session begins at 12 o'clock on Thursdays from 12 to 11. If you are interested, please email me. I put it in the chat. So on April the 8th, tomorrow is chapter 11, just like chapter 11 for this. And I have a chapter champion. You're more than welcome to come to that one as well. It's, it's free. There's no charge. Just email me. I'll give you the link. Uh, but April the 8th, is when I will, there'll be no chapter, no chapter champion, it's just gonna be me uh, summarizing and uh, providing some solutions that I believe that God has given me, so, uh, some visions with regard to housing and employment. And uh, you are more than welcome to attend tomorrow and, and next Thursday. Thank you, Melanie. And when Kim asks about what can we do, I feel compelled to share. Um, I took the groundwater training session with the um, Racial Equity Institute and all in coalition of Cincinnati with the Greater Cincinnati Foundation has provided those courses for free. So please keep an eye on the uh, Greater Cincinnati Foundation website for further opportunities. But a community activist in that session Said, what should we do? And she said, white people should talk with other white people about these issues. So I just want to be honest and open up my heart to the commitment I've made to that. And with Melanie's leadership, um, I intentionally hold conversations in different settings. And for example, um, in the work setting at the library with people around me, I talked about some of the issues I learned about with housing and redlining and all of the um, unconscionable things that has happened in the West End over generations. Um, so I encourage us to just hold these conversations with folks around you and in different settings with different people, be it relatives, be it coworkers, be it neighbor, uh, neighbors, 
but conversations and sharing worldviews is extremely important as we um, learn to understand what's before us, what's been hidden for generations. As Kim's pointed out, that was very um, important words that you shared about teaching history from certain perspectives and not all perspectives and the local connection as well. Um, what if children could learn about the history of their neighborhood before them? You know, I think that that's very important. So I'll stop there, but I think holding these conversations on what we're learning is extremely important. Mary, did you have any other notes to share? Um, we have a little bit of time left. And that was that was most of my notes, you know, about the facts of the chapter. Um, I had other observations and I guess kind of wanted to think more about like that quote that I, the quote from the Enquirer about like, what's the problem? What, what are, why are people protesting? Why, um, you know, in fair-minded Cincinnati, aren't things just fine? And it kind of felt like that could have been written recently when I read it. I thought like, well, I, I feel like I've heard those sentiments lately from, I don't know, just white people, <laughs> you know, what it, things seem fine. Like there's no issues anymore. Even, even that kind of sentiment, like, well, there might've been issues in the past, but like, aren't things pretty good for black people? Um, that kind of struck me that, that quote. And I felt like, wow. I mean, have, that was a pretty long time ago. And, and sometimes things feel the same or I'm hearing quite similar sentiments and that's pretty disappointing. Um, that was something that, that I noted and took from the chapter. Um, and another thing I took was just with Marion Spencer and there was another reference to um, a mom who wanted her son to go to Moonlight Gardens. He wanted to see a concert with friends. Um, and she called Coney during that time period and said, can my son um, and his friends come to the concert? And um, Coney said, sure, yeah, over the phone, not knowing who this group was or who these individuals were, we welcome you to come to the concert. And then the woman, you know, she knew she was, she, she let the operator or the secretary know that, you know, her son was black and the secretary said, oh, no, no, we, you would not be welcome. Um, your son would not be welcome and his friends would not be welcome. And that the instances of the moms calling on behalf of their children kind of struck me as, you know, that was that's a push for people to make it better for the next generation. Um, and probably got people more involved than they might have been. If it was just for themselves, I think they kind of think like, I can live with this. Um, I've lived with this for a long time, but when it came down to their children, that's when you you see certain, you know, more people stepping up and like, well, I might not be here forever, but I have children and I have grandchildren and I wanna, I wanna leave a better place for them. Um, so those were sort of the emotional pieces I pulled out that kind of spoke to me or made me, made it more real. You know, I, I could imagine or try to imagine what these mothers were feeling like. Um, and then led me to think about Timothy Thomas and that anniversary coming up. And um, I know there are some, that the library's working on some things to do with the anniversary and um, I think Washington Park is having a an event on the seventh. I don't know much about that, David. Do you know? Yeah, I know there's an event on Facebook that I'll. Sorry for the static. I'll plop a link in the chat on that. Just a moment here. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think these just conversations are just invaluable. And like you said, you know, talking with your families and your friends and is really important. I, I'd like to make a comment about the, the warmth in this group, um, uh, especially tempered with the anger that I was expressing um, that I feel and that I felt throughout 
uh, listening uh, to Melanie so beautifully read this book and her, um, her YouTube channel. <laughs> if um, you haven't taken the time to, for other chapters, I highly recommend uh, giving yourself this time with her beautiful reading of the of the entire book. But I want to say that in in this warmth, um, I'm I'm also slightly humbled um, by thinking about um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Warmth of Other Suns. Um, I hope you all have read that book, and if not, it's another like important um, one for your list also considering the, our town, um, the heritage of our town. And um, what I'm thinking about specifically is the uh, culture of polite Black Americans, um, like warmth and kindness and like, a politeness that was learned um, by force. And I think that, um, that there are many white Cincinnatians, I will speak for myself um, as a white Amer a Cincinnatian, who have really enjoyed the warmth, the politeness from the Black American community, from my, from my Black American friends. Um, and, and that is both a 100% genuine warmth and also um, comes um, to some extent with some uh, roots that are um, that we, I think are, are important to, to consider. Um, and I'm saying it because it is really easy for, um, for, for people to think there aren't any problems that, you know, like this whole, um, uh, this, the great quote, Mary, you were saying about, um, fair-minded Cincinnati, right? We can really live happily in our fair-minded Cincinnati, um, like uh, if, if things are so seem really smooth to us. And so there's like this contradiction for me in both like truly being grateful for the extraordinary warmth from, um, from I'll just say it, like from some people here and then definitely from, from, my, from my people, from my friends. Um, and, um, and I think I need to look deeper and uh, this, the facts in this book help us look deeper. And it's uh, only fair, Candace, for us to look deeper because some of what you're feeling is uh, because of facts, because what you're feeling is because of things that we're all a part of and continue to be a part of. And we have to stare in the face in a ways that, that aren't necessarily warm. Jennifer, uh, this is Melanie, and I, I was going to give you the floor, but it sounds like you have, uh, you know, you shared with me that you had read, listened to me read the entire book, and uh, was there anything else that you wanted to say about that, or did you pretty much speak what you had, what you were going to share? I, um, I think that the, it's so well read. Um, like just the, the articulation and the clarity, uh, the dense material, if you're intimidated by it with Melanie reading is just really easy. You're very good at helping us like through some of that difficult material. And, um, and uh, there's also, even on your channel, there's even more things that are really interesting. So just beyond also just mentioning, uh, beyond the reading of Race in the City, um, Melanie has um, interesting points of view to share through the, this, that, that's on that same YouTube channel. So awesome. thank, thank you, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Very good. And I uh, don't want to pass Cassie up. Cassie is um, one of my chapter champions and um, just wanted to give her a, a minute to just speak on that. Uh, her perspective of the book as a chapter champion of one chapter. I forget what it is. Is it seven, Cassie? Chapter seven. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Chapter seven. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, even though Race in the City may have been written about Cincinnati, it's not just about Cincinnati. I've come to discover it is about every city in America 
except maybe covert Michigan, which Sister Moon can tell you about. The circumstances and deplorable conditions in which the Negro American found, him, found themselves in was widespread and not self-inflicted. This was imposed on us by those who did not want to see us advance, but wanted to keep us at the bottom of society. It has impacted me in the respect that it has heightened my awareness of gentrification and the continued resulting displacement of the poor, the disenfranchised and the dispossessed. The Bible says, cry loud and spare not. In other words, lift up your voice like a trumpet, speak loud and distinct as our sister Candace did tonight. People need something to rouse them to a sense of their guilt, both black and white. Speak so earnestly that our attention will be arrested. We all need earnestly to pray for God's assistance in examining ourselves. The dialogue that the book has promoted has opened up a conversation that is both beneficial and enlightening. And I will forever be grateful to the Cincinnati Public Library for giving us this forum and for Sister Moon for introducing the book to us. And I just um, wanna add that I agree with um, David in saying that, um, you know, we just need to talk to each other. We need to, you know, because white people, you know, they have no idea the black experience you know when they go into a grocery store they just go to the grocery store buy their stuff hey you know no big deal you know our black men go to the grocery store and right away they're under stress because people are looking at them thinking they might steal something but i mean a white boy might steal something just as soon as a black boy so um you know it's it's um it's a, a dialogue a talking to each other so that we um, just so that we can have a conversation and understand where each other uh, is, is coming from. And I'm excited to hear of your initiatives, Sister Moon, uh, on the, the housing and the, um, uh, I forgot. Employment. The, employment. And employment and employment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, so thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you. Anybody want to be a chapter champion? I need chapter champion. <laughs> Thank you. Other thoughts? And thank you, Cassandra. Your words are powerful. You're welcome. I just wanted to comment one more time since this is our our last time in, in this series um how grateful i am for this forum because it's provided a safe place for us to express ourselves and to be open to others without judgment or fear of you know just awkwardness and having difficult uh conversations with a group that you can um, feel comfortable with is so valuable. So I want to just say how grateful I am for that. And I would love to continue in some way uh, hosting forums of this nature. So thank you, David and Melanie. Thank you, Catherine, chapter champion. We appreciate you. Mm -hmm. I was going to say a similar thing. I mean, I, I feel like I'm in community with you folks and many of you I just met tonight. Um, but through, I mean, it's an odd thing, this Zoom, but it, it allows us to do things. I probably would not have come out of the house tonight to go to a meeting. I probably wouldn't have been free to go to a meeting somewhere. I'd have been already signed up doing something else. But because of the way life is right now, um, we're, we're finding out how to do Zoom and, and we can meet so many more people uh, that we never would meet otherwise. So thank you 
library. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, everybody that came. We appreciate hearing that, Cynthia. Thank you. And I do want to give a special acknowledgement to Catherine and Sheila uh, for being chapter champions at our other two events in January and February. Thank you, David. We're learning and growing together and I value that very much. I was not able to find the Timothy Thomas Memorial date, um, unfortunately, but I'll, I'll dig and I know someone to ask. What we like to do is follow up via email. Um, so I will in the next day or so follow up with um, our chat, which has the links that we shared and thank you, Candace, for sharing your brother's podcast. I actually looked that up, but didn't want to share without your permission. So thank you for that. Um, and the other links that we've talked about, um, an honor and tribute to Mary and Spencer. Um, so I'm so glad we talked about that. Thank you, Ms. Thomas, for uh, reminding us about the statue coming up um, and the celebration so we can all be on the lookout for that. Uh, so we'll follow up via email, and I believe Melanie, as she's mentioned, is very eager for you to connect with her for her future events. And as we just heard, this is a community, and this is a community of learning and sharing. Um, and thank you, Candice. I will, uh, yes, put a link in for that. I'm so glad to learn about that podcast. Um, and uh, we'll follow up via email with uh, more information and more opportunities to learn on things that we've talked about tonight. Um, and you might have noticed I put a link to a survey uh, in the chat. Please consider taking the survey. And I will send that out to the folks that joined us on the prior two events. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, our Black Events and Exhibits Committee and the library as a whole is invested in creating events like these where we learn, grow, and celebrate the contributions of uh, Black Americans of Cincinnati and beyond. And we are kind of focused on music, education, and art, um, and visual art and ex exhibits, as the name uh, mentions. So your feed, there's opportunity for you to type in feedback of what kinds of things you'd like to see from your public library moving ahead. And our committee will look very closely at that. David, will you send that link? It's an awfully long thing. I don't know how to link things in my Zoom, but would you send that in the email as well for the I survey? I sure will. Yeah, and I'll see if I can shorten it. It was, it was long. That's okay, yes. but if I, think I can <laughs> click on it, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Thank you. We have a couple minutes left. Any closing thoughts? And as we began this evening, just special thanks to Melanie for bringing us all together. Uh, you are the reason we're here and your commitment to this book and commitment to community is just um, so important to us all. So thank you. And I cannot thank the library enough. I cannot thank you, David, Sheila, Mary, and Catherine. You did an awesome job. And everyone that has joined with us, thank you so much. Don't let it be your last time. Take my contact information, stay in touch with me, and I will keep you in the loop. Thank you. And with that, everyone have a good night and please take care. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Mary. <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Good, good night. night.